Hi everyone, I'm Elisha, I'm on the Hardwired staff, and I'm here to introduce our president, Tina Ramirez, uh, the president of Hardwired. Uh, you met her last week, and she is here to interview our honored guests, and that we're, our distinguished guests that we're so honored to have. Thank you, Alicia, and I am Tina Ramirez, the president and founder of Hardwired, and I'm really honored to be with you today and to be able to share with you a guest who I had an opportunity to work with in the U.S. Congress, Congressman Frank Wolf. Um, he was actually the one that helped recruit me to come work in Congress many years ago, and he was the original author of the International Religious Freedom Act in the U.S. Congress that made religious freedom a priority in our U.S. foreign policy, and I had the opportunity to help him build a bipartisan caucus to defend religious freedom and also to work with his staff which was very active on Sudan and South Sudan issues at the time and so um, it, it was an honor to be able to work up there with him on many different issues but uh, Sudan is one of the countries as I shared in the previous session that sparked my interest in human rights and in uh, in uh, addressing religious persecution around the world many years ago when I was a college student. And so it has a special place in my heart and I'm honored to be able to be with you and to, to share um, the expertise of others who can help walk alongside you as you are preparing to rewrite your constitution and develop as legislators. So let me just share a little bit more about Congressman Wolf. Congressman Wolf began serving in the US Congress in 1980 and he ended his final term was in 2014, so just a few years ago. He served in Northern Virginia, and as I mentioned, he was a champion for religious freedom. He was also a champion for international human rights, and he founded the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, which uh, is a bipartisan commission in the US Congress to help promote human rights issues across Congress in a bipartisan way. And so he can share a little bit more about that today. He had many other issues that he worked on across um, across the human rights field during his term in Congress. He also is a, a Christian and he is currently the, um, the first, so I wanna say this right, the first ever appointed Wilson Chair in Religious Freedom at Baylor University. And he is, a, is um, part of the 21st Century Wilberforce Initiative as well as a distinguished senior fellow. So without further ado, let me just thank you, Congressman Wolf. I mean, there is, we will include the bio, the full bio in the um, presentation materials, but thank you for your distinguished service to human rights, to the country, and um, as a man of faith with such integrity in leading um, and serving in the state of Virginia. So thank you. And I'll just let you give a short introduction, then we can go into questions. Okay. Well, one, I'm glad to be with you, Tina, and I want to welcome your the people who are watching and are going to be watching this incident. One correction, I, I no longer am with 21st Century Wilberforce. I, I retired from, from them. Uh, the issue of human rights and religious freedom is really very important to me. And really one of the countries that helped me get active in, in this was in a trip that I took to Sudan in 1989. I visited Kapweta. And uh, from that time, I uh, fell in love with the Sudanese people, went back many, many times, became very close friends with uh, John Garang. And as you may or may not remember, I was the one who asked President Bush to appoint a special envoy, uh, Senator John Danforth, who really, I think, did an outstanding job that led to the fact that your people now are able to represent themselves in another country, the country of Southern Sudan. So I have seen uh, what Sudan has gone through, the North-South War, where you lost over a million people in the problem. So there's a great opportunity that I hope your uh, government doesn't really miss. This is the time, and you better get it right. If you don't get it right this time, you're going to have some very serious problems. But you go ahead with the questions now. Yeah, thank you. And I had, it was such a great opportunity for me to be able to learn so much about Sudan under you and South Sudan. I took my first trip in 2007 with Ken Isaacs into the Nuba Mountains. So, um, it, you know, it, being a part of that process that you started with Dan Forth, and I remember that at the US Commission and, and then coming to Congress was so important and critical for people finding their freedom. So it's one thing to win the war, it's another thing to win the peace as we all know. So part of this process is just sharing our experience uh, and, and offering sage wisdom to those that are, are trying the same things that we tried so many years ago in our country. Um, 
so share with me, Congressman Wolf, what, what guides you in your pursuit of human rights as a legislator? What are some of the guiding kind of documents or principles that inspire you and that lead you as you're, as you're, as you're legislating and trying to promote these values in Congress? Uh, President Reagan said that the words in the Constitution and the words in the Declaration of Independence were a covenant, not only with the people in Philadelphia in 1776 and 1787 when the Constitution was ratified, but a covenant with the, with the people of the entire world. It's basically a covenant, what President Reagan said, with the people of Southern, Southern Sioux Sudan. So I think those two principles, the Declaration of Independence, all men and women obviously are created equal, endowed by, they're created by God, with life and liberty, the pursuit of happiness. That is almost the, the, the bedrock, the foundation, and then the Constitution, and as they develop their Constitution in, in uh, uh, Southern Sudan, the, Constitu the United States Constitution that protects human rights, religious freedom, the right to assembly, freedom of press, and different things. They are the, they are the bedrock. The other thing is there are so many passages in the Bible uh, that talk about about this issue. I mean, Jesus reading in, in the synagogue and uh, from Isaiah in Luke. And we have a passage, Ecclesiastes 4 1, I saw all the oppression under the sun. And the, in the Bible, it mentions over and over, Matthew 25, when I was hungry, you know, you fed me when I was uh, naked, you clothed me when I was in prison, you visited me. And I think there's so the biblical practices. I personally believe that at the end of my life, I'm going to be held accountable for what I did or what I failed to do when I really had had the opportunity. My first five years in Congress, I never did anything on human rights and religious freedom. What changed that was a trip to, to Ethiopia during the famine in, in 1984. And actually, we accessed it through Gam Gambella, very, very close to Southern Sudan. And then we also went to Romania in 1985. So at that time, uh, the issue of human rights and religious freedom became very, very important. And again, uh, the visit to Sudan, to Kupweta, I don't know if you've ever been to Kupweta, we went to Kupweta, Tori, a number of places. Uh, seeing what the Southern Sudanese people were going through, seeing the faith. I've been in the Nuba Mountains, uh, you know, I've been to the hospital and been through those places. To see the faith of uh, of, of the Christians in Southern Sudan is very, very strong. I, I have video where we interviewed a number of people and uh, they couldn't understand why America and the West wasn't speaking out for, for them. And so developing a friendship with John Garang, who I'm sure many of your people know very, very well. Uh, I took this on as an issue because I was really impressed in many respects, the Christian movement, if you will, in Africa is stronger than it is in almost any other place of the world. I've been going to Nigeria lately, and I'll tell you, the Christians in Nigeria, their faith is so strong, it puts to shame the faith of many Christians around the world. So the issue of Sudan drove it and continued to, to drive it, and I was pleased to be in uh, Kenya, Nairobi, uh, at the signing ceremony uh, where Southern Sudan got its independence and freedom. And I might say, not to be political at all, I'm very pleased to see that Bashir has been removed from office and now is in prison. And hopefully the Sudanese government will send him into the International Criminal Court where he belongs. Yeah. Well, you've seen so many different um, cases of violations of human rights around the world. and um, when you're advocating for these things internationally, what what, um, what kind of commonality or how do you appeal to other countries and to their sense of justice? How, what do you appeal to in order to help them um, understand the value of human rights as well? Well, it depends on the audience, obviously, but I generally reference the Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, also the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which has been signed by literally when it was adopted in 1948, it was signed by every single country. Obviously, Southern Sudan was not in existence at that, that time, but it was signed. So the Universal Declaration of Independence of Human Rights is very, very powerful. Uh, Dr. Malik helped, helped develop that. So I think they are the things. And lastly, my faith 
uh, knowing that I will be held accountable. And lastly, when I'm with the people, whether it be in Southern Sudan, whether it be in Nigeria, whether it be in the Coptic Christians in Egypt, or whether it be in the Iraq Christians up in the Indo Plains, I get more from them than I give them because to be with people whose faith is so, so strong, generally at the end of most of the meetings, I will say to them, what can I do for you when I get back in the United States? And invariably the first thing they say isn't, you know, give me foreign aid, do this, do that. It's they say, pray for me. So that sort of kind of how, I mean, I get more from them than I give when I go to places like that, but I've been very moved by the people. So my biblical faith, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, Universal De Declaration, I think make the difference. Yeah, and you were sharing a little bit about um, some of the issues that, before we got started, that you saw even here in Virginia, and how, how does your um, concern for human rights and your sense of obligation as a legislature influence um, your sense of justice even like for your constituents and where you're at like how did what what, what responsibility do you because you clearly shared it do you have as an elected official to to care for the justice even in front of you in your own community can you well, share a little I, about that sure. and some of the issues that you worked on sure well i think if you are going to represent the people you have an obligation to represent them not just on the most popular issues that you think but you should be a leader a leader means when they see issues to do something about it. I, I led the effort, as you know, in Virginia, we had a terrible gang problem, MS-13. I put together the funding to fight MS-13. We put together the task force. Quite frankly, I think the current governor is failing on that, but MS-13 were coming into neighborhoods and getting, doing things that I won't even get, get into. That was the leadership. Uh, we put together major feeding programs. We put together a gleaning program uh, down in the Shenandoah Valley with the apple growers, whereby we would go in and bring in church groups to kind of glean from the trees and take the apples and take various fruits and, and send them. We passed legislation to say, and you should look at it now, that from a liability point of view, schools and institutions can donate food to hunger centers and food banks without worrying about li li liability because you go to food banks now, the people are lining up. At Matthew 25, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. I worked on prison rape. There was a tremendous problem of people being raped in the prisons. I worked with uh, Chuck Colson, who I, I know you, you remember very well to pass legislation with regard to uh, ending prison rape in prison. We also worked with Chuck Colson. We put together the, uh, the Chuck Colson Prison Reform Commission to help lead to many of the changes. Chuck was a leader, as you know, on, on justice, on training. And so every time I saw an issue uh, on the issue of Lyme the disease, people were saying Lyme, and I'm sure you're People watching don't know, but Lyme is a disease you get from a tick. And so we put together the coalition to fight Lyme disease with former Governor Bob McDonald, appointed statewide commission. So whenever I saw a problem, I tried to, to deal with it. And I think you, your legislators from Sudan should look to see, not just is this a popular issue, but can they provide the leadership? Because maybe they will see things that nobody else sees and they're willing to mobilize, to put together town hall meetings in their villages, to put together Zoom sessions, to put together meetings, both to educate and to mobilize. But so wherever they see a problem, wherever they see a problem, and for the, during that period of time, I was on the public works committee that built roads, which had nothing to do with hunger, nothing to do with prison re 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 reform, nothing to do with Lyme disease, nothing to do with human rights. So I didn't allow myself to be kind of pigeonholed. Okay, I'm only on the committee for building roads, so I can just build build roads. Wherever I saw a problem, we try to reach it. And we try to reach out in a bipartisan way. As you know, the Tom Lantos Commission, when we asked them to establish it, we named it after Tom, Tom Lantos, who was a Democratic member of the House, very committed to human rights. So we always try to do it in a bipartisan way. I, I'm, I'm good friends of uh, 
Speaker, Speaker Pelosi, uh, Speaker Pelosi and I have been friends for years. Uh, there are many, uh, Jim McGovern, who's now the chairman of the, of the Town Blanchard's Commission, a liberal Democrat from Massachusetts. Uh, McGovern and I have worked together. So I, I think you would want to see an issue, deal with it, reach out, because hunger is not Republican or Democrat, it's everybody. Or sexual trafficking isn't Republican or Democrat, it's everybody. Lyme disease, you can get if you're Republican or Democrat. So I always try to cross coalitions and bring in the opposition party. And lastly, on most of the trips or many of the trips that I took, we try to have a Democratic member come with me so that we were able to make this a bipartisan issue. Uh, Congressman Tony Hall, yeah. a Democratic member from Ohio, is, was my closest friend in, in Congress. We're still close. In fact, we're, we're doing a major prayer event at, at, at 12 o'clock today. Every Monday, we do a prayer event uh, through the prayer, prayer breakfast for people around the world. And so we became good friends, even to the point that uh, he sent me $1,000 once I was in a very difficult race. So the fellowship and the friendship, we try to cross the aisle and not just stay in my own party. Sometimes I had more in common with Tony than I had with people who were Republican members serving in, in, in my caucus. So I think that was making it bipartisan as much as I could. Well, this is really good advice for um, people within South Sudan, where there's a lot of um, divisions over ethnicity and tribe, and um, you know, and other other aspects. And so, how how what are some good ideas and suggestions for how to build those relationships and and overcome? I mean, one thing you said is always look for things to problem solve. Like, and as legislators, that let that be one of your focuses. And then, secondly, um, try to do it in a bipartisan way, but Look for things that you can see eye to eye on that don't look at the things that are that, that separate you, but the things that you can find commonality on. What are some other, um, just any other wisdom and advice you have on how to build those relationships across the aisle with people that might see things very differently from you? Well, there are, there are two. One, and I'll, the most important one, I'll, I'll, it will be second. One is I never attacked individuals. I, I never went after anyone personally. I would attack an issue, I would say on an issue that maybe they didn't agree with me, I would go after the issue, but I never defamed anybody. I never tried to uh, uh, rip them apart. And so there was always that space that two people can see things differently and can be friends. And so I, I, the one thing is I just didn't go after people. I didn't attack people. I, I, I would attack an issue, talk about the issue, criticize what they were doing but not criticize them as individuals. I think the best thing, the best recommendation by far that I could give them would be what I did in 19, early 80s, Doug Coe, you remember Doug Coe who ran the, uh, the prayer breakfast? Prayer breakfast, yeah. He came, came by and recommended that we create a, a small fellowship group that would meet and so we put together a group. There were four of us, Republican and Democrat. Tony Hall was in the group. Yeah. And, and at first I said, wow, I can't believe it. I mean, here I'm going to sit down with somebody and tell them my, my, my most intimate thoughts. And Tony, as you know, was a liberal Democratic member, lived in Arlington County, which was in my district, <laughs> and, lived, and lived down the street, literally <laughs> a block away from the guy that I had just defeated. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and my district was a targeted seat. The Democrats knew I had Arlington and Fairfax. They knew they were going to get my seat back. So I said, Doug, how can I sit down with Tony and, and, and share? And, and because won't he call the Democratic Campaign Committee to, uh, and Doug said, no, trust us. So it took us a couple months <laughs> and we, we would meet every Tuesday. Uh, for, 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 for lunch. We would break bread. When you break bread with someone, Tina, yeah. when you eat with somebody, everything changes. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's almost a spirit. I mean, Jesus broke bread, ate with many. I mean, it, it, so we, we, we had lunch, we broke bread, and then we would, we would pray. We would go around and pray, uh, and then we would sort of become friends. And then it took a little while, it took a couple months. It didn't happen the first meeting or the second meeting. 
we try to find one issue whereby we could come together right. on that issue. And the issue at that time, and I'm sure your people will not remember, was the tremendous famine in 1984 in Ethiopia. Yeah. Uh, and I went to Ethiopia. Again, we were in Gambella with that little, it's like a little beak sticking in. Uh, we then went into uh, some of the camps, Alamata and Koram, and where every day people were dying. And I stayed in a camp. And Tony and I went, we stayed in a camp, and then I saw things. And so we came back and we worked together, uh, Republican and Democrat. And all of a sudden, then in 1985, when I went to Romania with Tony, Tony Hall and I went there with Congressman Chris Smith. We saw things and came back and we put in a bill and passed the bill to take away the most favored nation trading status from Romania. Yeah. And so it was so powerful during the debate when Tony Hall would get up and support me and the Democratic leadership got upset and I would get up and support when the Republican leadership didn't want to do it. And so yeah. the friendships that came and as again, we still, our wives are close. Okay. Our wives are in a small group i won't mention the other people in the group are both and you would know their wise republican and democratic members many in the cabinet uh and some others that you would very prominent who they they meet once a, a a month and they pray for the first lady and they work together and do things so that was the most important thing i did in congress that helped me to be a success one to, to pray together, to, to share together. And also it, uh, I, I, it kind of threw people off. Why is Tony Hall, a Democrat, getting up <laughs> and supporting Frank Wolf? What's, what's going on here? Many times we would, be, we would be together on the back rail. You've been on the house floor. We would, we, we would we'd be together when the house was in late. We would have dinner together. And so out of that, came more than anything else that I did in Congress. And I really attribute the fact that God put me together, and I thank that Doug Coe, who has since, as you know, passed away, got me. I would have never have done that on my own, because as you know, I lost in 76, lost in 70, barely won in 80. I was a targeted seat. The Democrats wanted my seat back in. They knew they were going to get it back in 82. And all of a sudden, I developed this friendship. And then in one very tough district, uh, election year. Tony Hall uh, did a lot of things to help me, called the press for me. Here's a liberal Democrat, close to Pelosi, <laughs> supported me, and then gave me $1,000, which is publicized, if you will, and told everybody that he, he was for me. So, wow. it, it, uh, so I would urge them. All because of your friendship with a liberal Democrat. Yeah. Try, try to get in a small covenant group based around the teaching principles of, of Jesus. And I think very good things will come out of their time. And uh, yeah, God. well, I think it's so encouraging for the members of parliament in South Sudan to hear this because uh, they've just come out of the civil conflict and there's a lot of divisions, but to know that, um, I mean, I think the premise of human rights is human dignity and this, the fact that we're all made in the image of God. And if we can start there and the way that you treat people, like you said, with respect and seeing them as, as human instead of liberal, conservative or you know one tribe or another uh, you can begin to build those bridges that will help have the really create the relationships that can push things forward for everybody so and not attacking them based on who they are but attacking issues instead so I think it's a lot of great advice for everyone including us here and I'm sure that they see all the divisiveness that's happening in America right now and so if we can do it here certainly they can do it there too so um let me let me give them one 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 final thing i think should, sure. be, should be done uh i've i've been to juba many many times uh there a couple of years ago i met with salva Kier, met with john grang's wife and i've been to Bar i think what southern sudan needs now is a conference here in the united states held at the bush library down in Dallas, because if it had not been for President Bush, Salva Kiir still wears that cowboy hat that George Bush gave him. Yeah. Uh, ask former President Bush 
to hold a conference at the Bush Library to bring together the various factions, uh, maybe bring in f former Senator and Special Envoy John Danforth, who negotiated the peace, maybe bring in some Andrew Natsios, who was headed AID, and, and have them come together uh, outside of Sudan, outside of Southern Sudan, in at the Bush Library yeah. in, in Dallas. I, I think it could be very, very powerful for the people of Southern Sudan, both with economic development, with aid from our country, and with many other things. So I think you really need to do something bold. And I think a bold thing would be to ask President Bush to hold a conference in Dallas at the Bush Library bringing Sal Bakir and Rick Mishar and all the different factions together with members of the parliament to come together for several days, hear from President Bush, hear from John Danforth, hear from others. And I think it could be a very healing and very important for the country of Southern Sudan. I want Southern Sudan yeah. to be successful because in many respects, if I had not asked President George W, if I had not gone, to Southern Sudan, if I had not fallen in a river in front of John Garang, if I had not been to Kuwaita, been to Torit, seen the hunger, and asked for the special envoy, Southern Sudan may not very well be. I said, I want this country, and for the longest period of time, I don't do it anymore, I must confess, every night before I went to bed, I prayed for the people of Southern Sudan. Frank, can you share some of the um, some of the things that you remember about John Garang that inspired you, his leadership in the country? Just I, I think so often we forget, you know, the, the the visionaries. And so you had such a good relationship. I'd love for you to be able to share some of those things. I can. There there are there are many because every time I went to Sudan. Uh, I would meet with John Garang and every time he came to Washington, he would come by my my office. There's one in particular, and it's in my book. My book's called Prisoner of Conscience, and it's in the book. It's the whole whole chapter. Uh, they said, you want to come? John Grang wants to meet you. So we then flew to uh, look, look at Chobi. We changed planes. We went into, at that time again, Kabweta. We went to a meeting. John Grang never showed. They said, no, you've got to travel uh, up country to here or there and see him. So we traveled. We didn't bring enough food or anything because we were supposed to go back that, that night. We traveled to Tori. We saw John Garang and then he disappeared and uh, they brought a cow out. They slit the cow's uh, uh, throat. The cow drops. They cook the cow. John Garang disappears. I said, where is John Garang? He said he wants to meet. They said, wait. And the next, that night it poured and it was a terrible, we never got to meet it. Next morning we get up we go again through through the jungle and they say, John Garang is up on this hill. And in order for you to get there, you're gonna to have to cross this stream. And I said, I'm not crossing the stream because the doctors told me I should be careful. The house doctor, the Congress the doctor in the Capitol said, don't go into water because there's a certain thing that can come up and don't do it. And so I said, I, am, I, I was mad. I was really angry with John Garang. I said, I'm not crossing the stream. I'm not getting in that water. And so they brought some logs for me to step on. And as I stepped on one, I stepped on the other, the log slipped out and I fell flat into the stream, soaking, wringing wet. There's a picture in my book of it. And I get up to the, to the top of the hill and sitting under a little Tuchel hut is John Grang with a boom box and he's laughing. And our friendship really blossomed with regard that so uh and then we would always always meet and then my last trip to juba i went by just to see mrs mr Garang. but i had great respect for john i think it's unfortunate what happened to john garang because i think had john garang lived i think the course of southern sudan would have been much smoother he understood the west he went to iowa the university of iowa or iowa state he understood us and i think he was uh he was a uh, uh, he, he was a giant. So there are a lot of stories, but that story where I said, I'll never cross that stream. I was angry with them. They bring out a log. I step on the log. I fall flat in, soaking, wringing wet. I get to the top and he's up there laughing at me. 
with a big boom box. He's sitting on it, just laughing and smiling. That's the story that sticks out. Uh, I think the picture may even be in, in my book. That's funny. What, what was his vision for South Sudan or for Sudan, really? I think he had a vision of really one, he was a good, he was a good military officer. I mean, he, he could organize the army like no one else, else could. He, he took on the South and don't forget, he took on the North and don't forget they had Tarabi and, yeah. and they had some pretty, pretty bad guys. I mean, don't, uh, Tarabi and Bashir had invited Osama Bin Laden. Bin Laden lived in Khartoum for, yeah. For four years, I've been in the Nuba Mountains. And what you saw that they did, I was in a town, uh, yay, y e i y, uh, where an Antonov bomber came over, and I saw the results of what the bomber had done several days before. Kids whose arms were ripped apart, and legs and eyes, and so John Garang provided that leadership. He was almost like, in many respects. He was almost like a combination of, of, of a General Patton. If you, maybe your recipients and people don't know, Patton was a military officer during the Second World War, uh, kind of kind of a Douglas MacArthur, uh, and then kind of really like a George Washington, a military leader who understood the democracy. So I, I think things would have gone uh, much better for the country of Southern Sudan had John Garang. Uh, how do the people of South Sudan, the members of parliament, how do they keep human rights as a priority um, w when power dynamics might aim to like threaten basic rights? I mean, how do they, how do they navigate that? Well, I think it's going to be very difficult. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. I, 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 uh, uh, that's what I really believe you need. I think the American Special Envoy currently now is not doing a very really good job to be honest with you. Uh, I think you need somebody like George W. Bush, uh, maybe Colin Powell would come to sort of bring a convening, kind of a new, a new approach, because they're all they're, they're good people. We're not attacking each other. But I, I think there needs to be something. I don't think it can be done in Sudan, because I don't think there's anybody in Sudan that currently has the convening power insofar as each side would feel comfortable with, with the other side. That's why I have felt, I even made the recommendation that, and I, and, and I know President Bush was willing to, to do it, Congolese Rice was willing to be his leadership, is to bring leading people from various actions to Dallas. Have you been to the Bush Library? Yeah, yeah, when Elizabeth uh, Hoffman worked there, I went and visited. Yeah, God yeah. bless Elizabeth. Yeah. Uh, bring and, and convene and bring in some speakers. Yeah. First, uh, President Bush would open it up and jump yeah. in, but bring in some others. And that way, I think there would be an opportunity for sharing and healing, but also for economic development because right. the resources that Southern Sudan have are incredible. They are. It could be the breadbasket oh. of Africa. It, it used to, it can be again, you could have, but I think there needs, so my sense is to do something like that would almost be a a triggering device, set an environment and, and a mood that could really, really make a difference. And I'm sure, I don't know who, but the, there are foundations that would pay for that. And again, you don't have to bring everybody into parliament there, but I think one of the, sometimes the best things we did were when we were away from Capitol Hill, when yes. we were not involved in the clutter and the, and the partisanship. And I think do something could be very powerful. One, I, th I think it's important because a lot of, a lot of people died uh, to get to your independence. Yeah. I mean, see me go to, I mean, I don't know how old are these people that are watching this go to the village of Yay and look at some of the film that I have of people torn apart. That the fear in a village. I remember the one time when the Antonov bombers coming over and lumbering, they just lumbered the fear of people running the little holes they jumped into. And I mean, so many people died. One woman I saw, she was she had shrapnel in in, in her head. Uh, the terrible, terrible con conditions. So when I think the price that the Sudanese, Southern Sudanese people paid, uh, so bad that you just can't let this thing fail. You got, you can't you got to let it fail. 
Let me ask you one final question, and you can answer this however you want. Um, we know that China has had an enormous influence and attempted influence in this area. Lot, China has the largest embassy in Khartoum. So tell me what advice you might have, because you fought the Chinese government a ton in Congress. I know because I was with you at those human rights hearings when you were fighting them tooth and nail on every human rights abuse in their country. So what advice do you have for members of parliament in South Sudan on how they deal with China? Be careful. One, China is, I don't know if they still go up to Khartoum, but you look at the Chinese embassy in Khartoum, Chinese restaurants all over the place. China and Nigeria, and many they come in, they, they give a grant for a, a project and they get their tentacles they, and you cannot get out. Be careful of doing business with China. Look what China is doing. In China today, the Catholic Church is being persecuted. Hundreds of Protestant pastors are in jail. They got two and a half to three million Uyghur Muslims that are in basically detention camps modeled after what the Nazis did. They have a cultural genocide in Tibet. They're taking the Falun Gong, which I don't know if you know much about the Falun Gong, taking the Falun Gong, arresting them and taking their organs out and selling their organs, selling kidneys, 50, 60, 70,000. It's disgusting. Uh, the, the so be, be wary of the Chinese government. Nothing good comes from getting aid and having the Chinese government get it. Look at the tentacles that they get in different countries and you never get to bring them back. Be careful. Well, I think that's a good place to end because, you know, it, it, establishing a new country and looking for allies and navigating internal politics, you, you just, it, you never want to start out with the wrong uh, allies in the beginning. It, it, it's, it's just, you know, it's going to impede progress that much more. So um, thank you for all of your wisdom and advice, Congressman Wolf. It's been, it's been fun to remember all of the different things that you've done so far on Sudan. And I think that your advice for them on Dallas and the President Bush Center is an excellent idea and it's something we'll follow up on as well. So thank you for that and for everything that you've done. Thank, thank you. Good luck. Yeah. yeah. Bye. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck next week too for on the 18th. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Bye. Alicia, you're going to have to cut it off. <laughs>